Mr. President, Your Honours, dear colleagues, friends and participants. After four days of extremely intense hearings, first we want to express our deepest thanks, appreciation and admiration for the survivors and witnesses who had the courage to speak in public of the events in 1965 through 66 and the following years. This is the first time that survivors of the 1965 events have had the opportunity to speak out. This International People's Tribunal was set up to render some form of justice to them, but also to all survivors and victims of the atrocities. Survivors and witnesses have talked about their sufferings, the brutal crimes they were exposed to, and the harm, discrimination, and stigmatization that they face until today. The survivors dare to speak about the unspeakable. They are brave and strong. They have shown that even after more than 50 years, the crimes and the consequences are present as if they occurred yesterday. They testified for themselves and for their families, but also for all survivors who could not appear before this tribunal. Their testimony has been broadcasted and preserved, and everybody in Indonesia and worldwide can and must listen to their voices. Although the homepage of the tribunal seems to be inaccessible in Indonesia, may be blocked, means have been found to circumvent this attack against the International People's Tribunal. This is another attempt to silence the voices of the victims. The testimonies shed light on the 1965 events and by doing this, they change the history as it is written and taught in Indonesia until today. <coughs> Those who testified got some relief, although the scars and sufferings remain. We would also like to extend great thanks to the experts who testified before the tribunal and who provided very valuable background information and explanations about what happened back then. However, Archives are not yet fully opened and a lot still needs to be done to clear up the full scale of crimes that were committed. We also want to thank all who supported and contributed in so many ways to the setup of the International People's Tribunal and who made it possible for the hearings to take place. Finally, Yet importantly, we want to acknowledge the testimony of the Commissioner of the National Human Rights Commission, Komnas Ham, Dr. Dianti Bachiadi. He demonstrated great courage to appear before the tribunal in an unofficial capacity. He reported on the difficulties of getting the recommendations of the report of the Komnas Ham implemented. The Commission spent four years investigating the crimes against humanity committed during the events of 1965. He confirmed that the Komnas Ham findings are very similar to the counts one to seven of the indictment that the prosecution submitted to this tribunal. There's enough evidence to open an investigation. Dr. Bachriari insisted that the truth must be revealed and properly established as a starting point for reconciliation. In other words, no reconciliation without truth. Mrs. Mariana Amiruddin, the commissioner of the Komnas Prempuan, the National Commission on Violence Against Women, also appeared before the tribunal. She attended the hearings and testified in her official capacity. <laughs> 
Mrs. Amrudin confirmed that the Komnas Prem One report, which documents sexual and gender-based violence committed during the 1965 events, describes cases and patterns of sexual and gender-based violence that are similar to those submitted by the prosecution in its indictment. We would like to thank both commissioners for their important contributions through their testimonies and through the reports that they have produced, all based on testimonies of victims. It is unfortunate that the government of Indonesia has not yet implemented the recommendation of both reports. I would also like to mention the difficult circumstances which the hearings of the International People's Tribunal faced. After more than 50 years, the government of Indonesia is still reluctant to acknowledge the facts and the crimes that were committed. It was not possible to hold the hearing in Indonesia and the government continues to suppress actively the truth about the 1965 events. That is more than regrettable. Nevertheless, it is a great success that the hearings here in The Hague have taken place and that many violations and crimes could be brought before the bench of judges who will assess the evidence. As a German citizen who lives every day with the knowledge of my country's recent criminal and bloody past, and as an international lawyer and here prosecutor before the International People's Tribunal, I would like to begin by quoting from the closing statement of the British lead prosecutor, Hartley Shawcross, in the Nuremberg trial. The law triumphs over the evil. The proceedings were not guided for the sake of revenge, but by the strong resolution that such heinous crimes never ever occur again. This well-intentioned hope, expressed by the lead prosecutor in a world still suffering under the shock of the Second World War, has been frustrated. History has proved that wars and attacks against the civilian population have continued in many regions of the world. In Indonesia, in the middle of the Cold War and only 20 years after the Nuremberg trial, the Indonesian government, through the military and the police in concert with certain social and religious organizations, committed mass crimes. They were directed against alleged members of the PKI, the Communist Party of Indonesia, and its alleged affiliated sympathizers. The specific intent was to eliminate them as a national group within Indonesian society. During the four days of hearings, we heard of mass killings, enslavement, imprisonment, torture, sexual violence, persecution, enforced disappearances, persecution through propaganda, and complicity of foreign countries, in particular by the United States of America, the United Kingdom, and Australia. The international community was aware about the mass crimes, but remained silent. The survivors still live with detailed knowledge of what their daily existence was like in those years. They live with the horrible torture and ill treatment perpetrated against them every single day and night. I dedicate to them the following lines by Jean Amery, a survivor of the Nazi concentration camp in Auschwitz. I quote, anyone who has been tortured, remains tortured. Anyone who has suffered torture will never again be at ease in the world. The abomination of annihilation is never extinguished. End quote. The survivors have to deal on a daily basis with their memories. They want to be recognized as victims of horrible crimes, and they wanted to give evidence of the incomprehensible, inhuman treatment that 
deprive them of their dignity as human beings. They ask the question, why was I selected to be imprisoned, tortured, enslaved? I was not guilty of anything. The families want to know what has actually happened to their loved ones, which torture methods were they subjected to, were they interrogated and by whom did they leave any hidden message for us, did they call out for help, how and where were they killed and by whom, were they raped and sexually assaulted, where were they disappeared to, why were they selected to be dehumanized. Both of them, the survivors and the families, are seeking justice. But what does justice mean for them? For both of them, justice means, among other things, finding the truth and getting answers to their excruciating and relentless questions which haunt them at night and deprive them of necessary sleep. When they do sleep, it is often inadequate. There is permanent restlessness in their souls and the events prey on their minds. They are permanently, permanently deprived of a peaceful life to this very day. In Indonesia, they are discriminated against, stigmatized and silenced until today. They demand to know the entire historical truth of what happened to their beloved ones, who are only ghost-like visions as long as no detailed information about their fate is available. Learning this information is the only way to re-establish the dignity of their beloved ones. Learning this information is the only way to release the living from these horrors so they are able to live their own lives free of unanswered questions and visions from the past. The prosecution believes that we have been able to present strong evidence during the four-day hearing. We believe this evidence convincingly proves the crimes against humanity as we have listed them in the indictment and demonstrates the responsibility of the state of Indonesia for these crimes. The evidence presented also confirms that the governments of the United States, the United Kingdom and Australia are responsible for complicity by offering significant and conscious support to the Indonesian government in its commission of crimes against humanity. However, there may be more foreign government involved. Many archives are still closed. By actively disclosing the evidence, foreign states could contribute to the legitimate search for the truth. The prosecution incorporates and refers to the prosecution's brief outlining the legal framework under international law as applicable to crimes against humanity as charged in the indictment. The indictment does not and cannot cover all crimes that were committed. Part of the attack against the civilian population was the eviction of people from their land. Entire villages were emptied and people forcibly transferred. Their property was confiscated and they lost the basis for making their living. <coughs> Until today, the government does not recognize their losses and does not compensate them. The prosecution acknowledges the commission of these crimes. However, they could not be included into this indictment before the International People's Tribunal. Further investigation of these crimes is urgently needed. I come now to state responsibility under international law. Pursuant to the articles on the responsibility of states for internationally wrongful acts, 
the state of Indonesia is internationally responsible for the acts committed. These articles represent customary international law and thus legally binding on all states. A state is responsible for the commission of serious crimes, such as crimes against humanity, if it facilitates, aids, abets, supports and commits such crimes under their responsibility and through state actors. The acts were committed under the full responsibility of the state. General Suarto immediately assumed de facto control of the capital and the armed forces on 2nd of October 1965. A new operations command for the restoration of security and order, Kopkam Tip, was established on 10th of October to implement the liquidation of the PKAI and alleged sympathizers. On 1st of November 1965, General Suarto was appointed as the chief commander of the COPCAM TIP. Consequently, this command operated under the direct orders of General Suarto. Under the command of the army and in alliance with conservative religious forces, widespread and violent student demonstration spearheaded a campaign to remove President Sukarno from power and annihilate the PKI. In March 1966, General Suarto wrested control from President Sukarno. The following year, he was appointed as President of the State of Indonesia. General Suharto and his associated, associate sorry, immediately blamed the PKI as the masterminds of the 30 September movement. A military propaganda campaign distributed pictures of the dead generals with claims that communists, particular communist women, had tortured and mutilated them before death. As a result, Violence and demonstrations by the army and various youth groups, equipped and supported by the military and the government, began targeting suspected communists in Aceh, Central and East Java, before spreading all over Indonesia. Civilians were killed, raped, tortured, enslaved, or subjected to other crimes against humanity in their own homes or in public places. On 21st of December 1965, General Suarto issued an order for military leaders around Indonesia to compile lists of members of the PKI and PKI-affiliated organizations in their respective areas. Civilians whose names were included in these lists became the targets for gross human rights violations, including murder, torture, and other crimes. During the hearing, the prosecution explains in detail the chain of command, which demonstrates that the military military police who committed the crimes acted on the orders of the Indonesian state and in concert with civilian and religious groups and militias who were instrumentalized and used for the commission of the crimes. Now, I want to move on to detail the different counts and discuss the evidence that we presented during the four days. Evidence which we submitted to the judges. Um, these are researchers' reports and then uh, other material evidence and the testimonies of witnesses and experts. All nine counts are committed as underlying offenses of crimes against humanity. Immediately after the events of the 30th of September, a widespread and systematic attack was committed against a significant part of the civilian population. The target groups were members of the PKI, members of its affiliated groups and organizations, and anybody who was perceived as a supporter or sympathizer of the PKI. In particular, 
state authorities committed the following offenses as part of the attack against the civilian population. Count one, murder. The prosecution presented the statement of Mr. Matono, a survivor of the 1965 events. For two years, he was detained by the military. During detention, he was tortured and was forced by the Opus' special team consisting of members from the military, Air Force, Mobile Brigade and political parties to dispose of corpses of those killed during massacres in the Bengavan River in Solo, central Java. He picked up the bodies at the Diponeg Goro Detention Center, where detainees were electrocuted. Mr. Matoni estimates that he disposed of two bodies daily, ranging up to 20 bodies during weekends. Further, we heard the expert witness, witnesses Mr. Ferry Putra, an independent journalist, and Mrs. Ngati, and Ms. Dwyer, who could establish that mass murder took place immediately after 1st of October 1965 and lasted until 1967. The experts gave an overview of mass killings that took place in all areas of Indonesia and in a widespread and systematic manner. In 1999, Ms. Dwyer collected testimonies from witnesses who knew the locations of mass graves in Bali. Between 80,000 and 120,000 people were killed in Bali in the period of December 1965 until March 1966. This is 5.8% of the total population at that time. Some of these mass graves contain the remains of 200 victims, among which are members of the PKI and the affiliated Indonesian Farmers Union BTI, but also people with no political ties, such as children of the ages of 11 and 12 years. In Bali alone, at least 100 mass graves have been identified. In Bali, the killing started in December 1965 after the arrival of the special forces. These special forces conducted killings together with other military personnel, locals, PNI members and associated militias and Ansor, Ansor militias from Java. The military and local police also ordered civilians to take part in the killings in neighboring villages and threatened to kill their family if they refused to cooperate. We heard about one example of the excavation of a mass grave based on the position of the human remains in the mass grave, forensic experts concluded that the victims stood in one line before they were shot dead and the shooting was carried out in a short period of time. According to the expert witnesses and from the data they collected, the different sections of the military, military police of the state of Indonesia were the perpetrators of the murders also in concert with civilians used and instrumentalized by the army. Research shows that priests were also asked to be part of execution teams or to escort victims to the places of execution. The military command directed the killings and solicited local militias. The prosecution concludes that evidence proves that widespread and systematic killings took place as described in the indictment under the count of murder and that the state of Indonesia is responsible for the commission of these crimes. Count two, enslavement. The evidence presented through the testimony of a survivor who testified under protect, protection measures and the expert witness, Mr. Asfi Woman Adam, shows that during the 1965 events, widespread and systematic enslavement took place. The survivor described quite clearly that arrests experienced by the victim were carried out by the district military command, while the transfer of the prisoners to other prisoners 
prisons were, was carried out by the police and the military, the CPM unit. The survivor belonged to an ethnic Chinese student organization which was not related to the PKI. When arrested, he was stripped naked. After several transfers, he was brought to Buru Island where he was subjected to forced labor. In total, he was detained for 14 years. The military who detained him did not give any reasons for the detention. No arrest warrant was issued. He was under the control of military guards. He did not receive any remuneration for his forced labor. After his release, he was required to report once a month, and later in Jakarta, he had to report once every three months. Before prisoners were released, they had to sign a statement where they confirmed that they were not treated badly. They also had to choose a religion. The expert witnesses witness described the detention system with a specific focus on Buru Island. He concluded that the basic reason for the crimes was in following the order of General Suartu. He gave a speech in which he said that the Communist Party should be destroyed at its roots. Various military units interpreted the order in different ways, carrying out arrests, detaining, and even killing people. In succeeding years, those who criticized the government were branded as communists, and the danger of communism was deliberately kept alive in order to control the people. The conditions in the prison cells was very poor. Prisoners were tortured, food was restricted, and health services not available. Initially, prisoners did not have access to families only at the end of their prison time. Prisoners were categorized into three groups. Group A was considered to be involved in the murder of the generals and tried in military tri tribunals. Category B, who were deemed to be involved with less evidence, and C, were sympathizers of the PKI and less involved. The expert further explains the chain of command and demonstrated that the commander of Kopkam Tip decided on all matters. Thus, the state of Indonesia bears the ultimate responsibility for the enslavement of the prisoners. On Buru Island, at least 11,000 people were enslaved. The purpose was to ensure that other people were not influenced by communist ideology to isolate communists and to ensure people followed Pancasila. At the beginning, the government justified the detention on Buru Island to secure the elections of 1971. However, the prisoners were not released after the elections. In 1978 and 79, the detainees were finally released due to pressure from international organizations and from donors. Women were imprisoned in Platungan prison. In addition to the similar bad conditions, female prisoners were subjected to sexual violence. If they became pregnant and gave birth, family members brought up the child because there was nobody to take care of them. The prosecution concludes that the evidence proves that widespread and systematic enslavement as part of the attack against the civilian population took place, as described in the indictment under the count of enslavement, and that the state of Indonesia is responsible for the commission of these crimes. <coughs> count three, imprisonment. The prosecution presented two witnesses and survivors, Mr. Bejo Untung and Mr. Matono. In addition, Mr. Skefiringa testified as an expert witness. Mr. Ntung was a member of an independent students' association, which the military characterized as affiliated with the PKI, although it was a cultural organization. 
when he was arrested by the 5th Army Military Command in Jakarta, he was stripped naked and tortured through electrocution. He could hear other victims who screamed while obviously tortured as well. An arrest warrant did not exist. Reasons for the detention were never given. The deprivation of liberty was arbitrary and without legal basis. He was never brought before an independent and impartial court. He was also held in prison under poor conditions without access to sufficient food and health care. The prisons were overcrowded. Prisoners had no access to a lawyer and their families and relatives did not visit them. Today, Mr. Untung chairs a victims association. He himself collected 200 statements of survivors who were imprisoned. Likewise, Mr. Motono was held in detention without any legal basis and due process. He was also tortured and electrocuted and subjected to interrogations. Ms. Beringa explained that there were three waves of purges. First, prisoners were tested in 1966 following purges of members of the military and the bureaucracy who were deemed sympathizers of the PKI. The second wave of testing was in the early 1970s, for instance, in Buru Island, for which more elaborate tests were developed. I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but <clears throat> I know that you have a written document there which you would ideally like to read to the end. Yes. Um, I wonder whether time constraints will allow us to do that. And I wonder whether you would not be able to concentrate on the main points and let us have the document in writing, because at the rate at which you have been going, I don't think you'll finish before quarter to one And, and then that, that does take a long time. So is it possible or is it not what, possible? What time is it now? Uh, it's already I'm after 12, yeah. Sorry? It's already after 12 o'clock. Um, I do my best to make a concise presentation. Please. Um, I continue with the third wave, which was at the end of the 1970s to determine who could be liberated. Those deemed more staunchly communist were released much later. A major aim of the operation was to have the COP country action accepted as normal. On 1st of November 1965, Nasushin established that prisoners should be categorized. Ms. Veringa described the categorization of prisoners. Psychologist, psychologists in close cooperation with Dutch universities developed tests which were used to identify who might be a communist and to what degree of involvement. The prosecution concludes that evidence proves that widespread and systematic imprisonment took place as described in the indictment under count three and that the state of Indonesia is responsible, responsible for the commission of these crimes. Count four, torture. The prosecution presented the testimonies of the survivors, Mr. Mohamed Yusuf Pakasi and Mr. Martin Alida. Mr. Pakasi was a civil servant. He was arrested and subsequently tortured during interrogation. He was asked to provide names. He named those who he knew, but the torture continued. The torture was so severe that he became unconscious. Mr. Alida was a journalist and worked for a PKI-affiliated newspaper. He was arrested and also tortured. He described various forms of torture which were used during interrogation. He was detained for one year. He reported about others who were tortured as well. The prosecution concludes that evidence proves that widespread and systematic torture was committed, as described in the indictment under count four, and that the state of Indonesia is responsible for the commission of these crimes. Count five, sexual violence. 
the prosecution presented for this count the testimony of one survivor of sexual violence who testified under protection measures and Ms. Ringa as expert. The survivor described that she was stripped naked while arrested and interrogated. The military searched for a mark on her body that would show a sign from the women's organization Gawani. Her genitals were born, burned and she was heavily tortured and raped during detention. She was also forced to oral sex. Eventually, she was physically and psychologically destroyed. Until today, she is still suffering from these sexual attacks against her. She is still wondering why these crimes were committed against her and could not get an answer until today. Ms. Wieringa presented an overview about the patterns of sexual violence committed mainly against women. She conducted herself research and interviewed survivors who met in focus groups. She also, represent, she also presented research results of other researchers in this field. According to the experts, sexual violence was widespread and systematically committed. All forms can be found. She reported of vaginal and oral rape, mostly during interrogation and detention, being stripped naked and sexually assaulted, sexual slavery, enforced prostitution, mutilation of sexual organs, and enforced pregnancy. All women faced the sexual attacks under coercive circumstances, often while in detention. The perpetrators, military and militiamen, often acted in groups. They enjoyed impunity. Superiors were often involved and present. Nevertheless, these crimes were neither prevented nor punished. Shame and stigmatization continue until today. The prosecution concludes that the evidence proves that widespread and systematic sexual violence was committed as described in the indictment under count five and the state of Indonesia is responsible for the commission of these crimes. Count six, persecution. Under the count of persecution, the prosecution presented the statements of Mr. Sorono and Mrs. Amina, whose Indonesian nationalities were revoked. They were brought between 1965 to 1967 in the Soviet Union in, and in Bulgaria, respectively. They were deprived of their right to return safely to Indonesia. Like the two survivors, most Indonesians abroad were students or government officials, journalists or others who were in official capacity abroad. The Indonesian embassies actively screened Indonesians worldwide. The screening team systematically invited all Indonesians into the embassy and interviewed them about their attitudes towards Sukarno if they did not follow the invitation and or if they were <coughs> identified as supporters of Sukarno or considered to be communists and not loyal to Suharto, their passports were revoked and they could not return to Indonesia anymore. They were outlawed and eventually became stateless for decades. The prosecution concludes that the evidence proves that widespread and systematic persecution on political grounds was committed as described in the indictment under count six and that the state of Indonesia is responsible for the commission of these crimes. Count seven, enforced disappearance. The prosecution presented two witnesses, Mr. Astaman Hasibuan, whose father disappeared. The parents were members of a local branch of the PKI, his father, was arrested but eventually could not find information where he is, whether and where he died and where he was buried. He searched for witnesses. Since 10th of December 1965, he lost all traces of his father. The witness confirmed that in many cases, people were arrested, transferred to different places and then simply disappeared. Mostly at night, they were taken from their place of detention and never returned. Their families have never received information of their whereabouts. The prosecution submits <coughs> that the count of disappearance as crimes against humanity is established. The second witness, Mr. Mrs. 
Miss Intan told the story about her brother, father, and then her mother who were arrested by the military. They were accused to be a member of the Communist Party. The father disappeared from the prison. Other family members were also detained and disappeared. She searched everywhere and until today, not knowing haunts the victims who lost their family members and asking the same questions. Where are they? In total, seven members of her family disappeared. She suffers severely until today, feels helpless and is haunted by her memory. The prosecution thus concludes that the evidence proves the widespread and systematic disappearance as described in the indictment under count seven and establish the responsibility of the state of Indonesia for the commission of these crimes. Count eight, persecution through propaganda. The prosecution presented the testimony of the expert witness Ms. Bringa and Mr. Halambang, who explained the use and functioning of propaganda that incited and eventually led to the commission of severe crimes. Ms. Bringa described that the PKI was branded as atheist and thus being anti-Pancasila and against the nation, since everybody in Indonesia is religious, being accused of being an atheist without sexual morals fell on fertile ground. This stigma continues until today. Immediately after 30th of the September coup, the military established the narrative through the book of the military historian Guru Noto Susanto, which was already published in December 1965. Newspapers were banned and only army-owned newspapers were allowed. The military spread the false story that girls from Gavani seduced the general, danced naked and castrated them. The PKI was accused of having trained the girls. Although the results of the autopsy evidence showed that this was untrue, it is still until today a common opinion, often uncontested, that the sexual immoral PKI murdered the generals and used the girls to assault them sexually and take their manhood. The anti-PKI campaign was widely spread via various means and instruments, including movies, school curriculum, books, ceremonies, and monuments. Experts' analysis also confirmed that the hate propaganda led to acts of discrimination, marginalization, humiliation, and dehumanization of the PKI, and in particular, Garvani, including those who might be affiliated with them. The propaganda created cultural fear. Ms. Bringer concluded that the military was conscious about the powerful effects that the propaganda campaign, full of lies, could and would have. The radio was the most effective means to spread the propaganda campaign. The prosecution concludes that the evidence proves that widespread and systematic persecution through propaganda took place as described in the indictment under count eight. The responsibility of the state of Indonesia for the commission of these crimes could be established. Come to the last count, number nine. Complicity by the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia. The pros prosecution presented two expert witnesses, Mr. Simpson and Mr. Halambang, who informed us about the US, UK, and Australian involvement and support given to the state of Indonesia. Mr. Simpson could establish that the US government conducted covert operations before the 30s of the September coup and sought to take advantage of the events to urge the Indonesian army to destroy the PKI. The US, UK, and Australia provided radio communication in order to facilitate the communication within the troops, delivered small arms and money. They supported Indonesia in the commission of the mass crimes. Even lists of PKI members were provided. Mr. Halambang explored another area, the cultural influence through the CIA, which manipulated the Indonesian intellectuals 
to uphold anti-communist opinions. The prosecution concludes that the evidence proves that the US, UK and Australia are accomplices in the commission of the crimes of murder, enslavement, imprisonment, torture, sexual violence, persecution and forced disappearance as crimes against humanity. After four days of hearings, I want to revisit the question of my colleague and chief prosecutor who asked in the prosecution's opening statement the questions, why are we here? We conclude that we made an important and enormous step forward on the long journey on the search for the truth, which was silenced for so many decades. It is also a great step forward to call upon Indonesia to acknowledge and recognize eventually the report of the National Human Rights Commission from 2012 to follow their recommendations and to start immediately proper investigations into the large-scale crimes that were committed. We truly believe that the International People's Tribunal will open the door for a genuine acknowledgement of the crimes committed by the Indonesian government and the individual perpetrators. We truly believe that it will open the door for sincere apologies, for reparations, and for rehabilitation of those who are discriminated until today. The tribunal will also significantly contribute to the long and continuing fight against impunity. The survivors call upon the international community to acknowledge their complicity to break the silence and put the historical record right. This tribunal is also indispensable in reminding everyone that such crimes must never occur again.